This is Why Kids Don't Listen and What You Can Do About It. I'm Dawn Friedman. I'm a therapist in private practice working with little kids, big kids, teens, and adults. And I've recently launched a membership site called You Are Not Your Mother, which is for parents who want to interrupt family patterns of dysfunction in their own parenting. So if there's nothing else that you get out of this training, I want you to get this. This is Ross Green, and he's a kid psychologist and the author of The Explosive Child. Maybe you have heard this before, but his mantra is children do well if they can. You can read more about Ross Green at his website, Lives in the Balance. And his children do well if they can fuels all of the work that he does with kids. And I think it's incredibly helpful because we get used to sometimes being frustrated with our kids thinking, boy, they are just willfully not doing the thing that I want them to do. Instead of seeing it as we are either misunderstanding each other or this child is not able developmentally to do the thing that I want them to do. Children actually don't want to ruin their lives and ruin their relationships with us. And so they really are about, they're doing as well as they can. And we of course are doing as well as we can too. He has a terrific bill of rights for behaviorally challenging kids that I pull out in my office a lot. You can find it on his site. If you don't wanna go searching for it, let me know and I will email it to you. So one thing to know is that parents are most likely to lose it with their kids during bedtime, bath time, meal time, or trying to get out the door. All of those transition times, which not coincidentally are when kids are least likely to listen. So that is a normal time to be very frustrated with your kids. On the other hand, parents who understand these frustrations from a developmental point of view, who have a pretty good grasp of child development, report feeling less frustrated and more confident in their parenting. And so when we're talking about why kids don't listen, we're going to come at it from this children do as, do well if they can, and that there is something going on developmentally. So that's what we're going to run through in this training. So these are the facts about child development. And I pulled these from the nitty gritty child development course, which is available in the membership. Okay, let's go. First of all, Child development is pretty predictable. Babies pull to stand before they're able to walk. Generally, toddlers learn to walk before they run, although some toddlers, they start out running right from the get-go. But it's a predictable order, right? You gotta walk or you gotta pull to stand before you walk. You have to make babbling noises before you can actually talk. So there is a predictable order. But every kid has their own timeline. So uh, a child might crawl for a really long time before they walk, and another kid may barely crawl and go straight to walking. Also, development is asynchronous, which means that kids tend to grow like this. And those of you who have or have worked with gifted children may really see this. Gifted children may be way ahead academically and way behind social and emotional. Some kids may be great at making friends and be terrible at multiplication tables. We can expect kids to be good at some things and not at others, just like we are. And sometimes they'll catch up later on and sometimes they will always struggle a little bit in this way or that way. It, but it's a common challenge with parents who will be, who will say, she's so bright, why isn't she getting this? Well, the answer is because she can't. She's, she is very bright, but that doesn't mean that she's good at this other thing. And that includes listening. This is really, really important. I always use a screen door as an example. So kids need to learn the same things over and over again in every new context. A preschooler lets the screen door slam because they don't have the motor skills to let it close softly. An elementary aged kid may let it slam because they're already thinking of themselves out the door to the bike or the skateboard or the best friend and they don't have time to think about it. A teen might let the screen door slam because they're testing limits, because they're being passive aggressive or aggressive or aggressive. We see it as the same behavior every time. It's a screen door slamming, but for a child, they're coming at it from uh, different ways and different parts of de development. It, I just realized I can't see the I can't see the chat. So Maddie, if somebody asks a question on chat, will you tell me? Yes. Okay. Maddie is going to tell me if you have a question. So, also, did you know you guys can raise your hand and stuff in in Zoom? But the problem is. I can't see that because of this screen sharing I'm doing. But Maddie, Maddie will do that because, yeah. 
do you want to just take your just show them your face for a minute okay maddie's going to show you her face for a minute there's Hi. maddie Hi. she's my almost 17 year old and as she knows she i told her i was going to say this she is the one who struggles with listening the most in her in her family yeah and you're maddie if you have something to say you're welcome to chime in. okay all right Oh, and also the reason why you see a lot of books about babies and then a few books about toddlers and fewer books still about school agers and very few books about teens is even though child development is pretty, like we kind of know what happens, the older we get, the more individual we are. And so we can say things about one and two and three year olds, but we can't say the same kind of general things about eight, nine and 10 year olds or 15, 16, 17 year olds. All right, as you're thinking about this training, I want you to know that I'm gonna say general things and your child is an individual. So they may, it may make sense in, for your kid and it may not. So listening looks like something really easy. A parent say, why don't they listen to me? Like it should be clear, I say a thing and they should do the thing. But actually listening is made up of a lot of skills. Now the researchers call this stages, but I do think of them more as skills. And we're gonna run through those and spend a little more time on some of them than others. And I'm really hoping my video works because it worked when I tested it, but also the screen sharing did. So we'll just have to see what happens. All right, the first part of listening is having ears that work and that's called receiving. Kids get screened for hearing a lot, but it also gets missed a lot. And with the rise of earbuds and headphones, we're seeing more hearing loss in kids. So something you can pay attention to is do they turn the TV or their tablet up really loud? And it sounds normal to them. You're always saying, turn that down. And it, it sounds normal to them. Do they miss bits and pieces of conversations? Do you have to call their name several times? And of course, you sometimes just have to call their name several times. But are you noticing like maybe they really aren't hearing? And do they speak really loudly? And you say, keep your voice down and they can't. They, you know, take them into the pediatrician, go ahead and do it, hearing screening. We, we're seeing more hearing loss in teens because they do wear their earbuds an awful lot. And I don't know, Maddie has them in. I like it better when she wears the over the head ones. Those are actually better for their hearing because when they have them in the way I have mine in right now, they're piping straight into your ear. So the rule that they say for protecting hearing is no more than 60% of the maximum volume and only have earbuds in your ears for about 60 minutes. If people can hear the music, it's too loud, they say. I don't know what that has to say about noise canceling headphones. I almost think that's not necessarily a good indicator that it's not too loud because I think that they're just, some of the noise canceling headphones seal things off so well that it may be damaging their hearing even though you can't hear it. But yeah, so th this is a real issue. If you think your kid's having hearing trouble troubles, have it checked out. I personally would say, just have it checked out as a matter of course, especially after this year when a lot of them have headphones on a whole lot more than usual because of Zoom school, et cetera. The other thing is sound discrimination, and that's ability to hear details. If I say, go get your sister, and they think I said, go get your sitter. Uh, this can be especially challenging in noisy environments for all of us, but about one third of first graders have lousy sound discrimination. So that's just a thing to know. One third of first graders are having trouble hearing in the classroom if there are other things going on, if other kids are talking, if they're sitting next to the air conditioner or heater or fan, they may have trouble hearing. So that's a thing to know too. We're gonna to spend a little more time on understanding and auditory processing. I don't, how many of you have heard of auditory processing disorder? Could you post in the chat and Maddie will tell me if anybody did that? Can you type no if you haven't, because that will help me No too. I can't read it from here, Maddie. You just have to tell me. Siobhan said yes. Siobhan has heard of it. And then Marga said no. Okay. Okay, so half and half of you have heard of it. So auditory processing is about the journey from your ear, I hear the thing, to your comprehension, to your understanding of what's happening. And that journey in between those two places 
is auditory processing. And it is developing from birth to about 14 or 15. So this is one of those places we're gonna see asynchronous development. Some kids are not going to be as good at this as others. And this is kind of a murky thing, auditory processing, as far as people's understanding goes. And I know this because we tend to talk about it only in the context of an auditory processing disorder which can get, it can be pretty hard to get diagnosed and pretty hard to get treated. When I've had clients come in here and this is what's going on, or it looks like this is what's going on, finding someone who can diagnose it and treat it is really challenging. Like you think here in Columbus, the speech, Columbus speech and hearing, they had one person who was able to work with it. And then my understanding was she quit because I just remember we went on this wild goose chase trying to find somebody to help a client with it. But basically an auditory processing disorder is a little bit like dyslexia where they're just not understanding language in the same way a child with a learning disability may struggle to read. And it can look like, it can look like hearing problems. It can look like they're having trouble with hearing things in a noisy environment, that they're misunderstanding things, that you have to call their name a whole lot to get their attention, that they have difficulty concentrating or paying attention. So this can be misdiagnosed as ADD or ADHD. They might not enjoy listening to music and they may have trouble following complex directions or somebody who's talking really fast. And again, this can get misdiagnosed a lot. It's sometimes people have trouble differentiating this with spectrum disorders. They may think it's just willful obstinance. Now, three to 5% of kids meet the criteria for auditory processing disorder. I'll tell you my bet is that it's higher and that it's underdiagnosed. And some kids will sort of grow out of it. It's sort of like ADD where some kids, it's a developmental issue and they'll grow out of it. And some kids are gonna need intervention. And I'd say if a child is really struggling with functioning, that's a sign that they probably need some extra support. So if you, think that something like this might be going on, it might be good to talk to someone about what would this look like? Are you seeing this in my child? Again, it's, it's difficult to diagnose. At the end, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about where you would go to start about, start figuring this out. So anyway, auditory processing, they can hear us, but they can't really necessarily make sense of what we're talking about. That leads us to theory of mind, which is really fascinating. I'm going to play a video and really hope it works. I'm going to show you a five-year-old who's getting a standard kind of puzzle that we call the false belief task. This is the first pirate. His name is Ivan. And you know what pirates really like? What? Pirates really like cheese sandwiches. Cheese? I love cheese. Yeah. So Ivan has his cheese sandwich and he says, yum, 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 yum. I really love cheese sandwiches. And Ivan puts his sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. And Ivan says, you know what? I need a drink with my lunch. And so Ivan goes to get a drink. And while Ivan is away, the wind comes. And it blows the sandwich down onto the grass. And now, here comes the other pirate. This pirate is called Joshua. See? And Joshua also really loves cheese sandwich. So Joshua has a cheese sandwich. And he says, yum, 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 yum. I love cheese sandwiches. And he puts his cheese sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. So that one is his. That one's and Joshua's. That's right. Be, and then his went on the ground. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, So he won't know which one is his. Oh, so now Joshua goes off to get a drink. So Ivan comes back and he says, I want my cheese sandwich. So which one do you think Ivan's going to take? I think he was going to take that one. Yeah, you think he's going to take that one? All right, let's see. I told you. Oh, yeah, that. you were right. He took that one. <laughs> So that's a five-year-old who clearly understands that other people can have false beliefs and what the consequences are for their actions. Now I'm going to show you a three-year-old who got the same puzzle. And Ivan says, I want my cheese sandwich. Which sandwich is he going to take? Do you think he's going to take that one? Let's see what happens. Let's see what he does. Here comes Ivan and he says, I want my cheese sandwich. And he takes this one. Uh-oh. Why did he take that one? His was on the grass. Oh. So the three-year-old does two things differently. First, he predicts Ivan will take the sandwich that's really his. 
And second, when he sees Ivan taking the sandwich where he left his, where we would say he's taking that one because he thinks it's his, the three-year-old comes up with another explanation. He's not taking his own sandwich because he doesn't want it because now it's dirty on the ground. So that's why he's taking the other sandwich. Now, of course, development doesn't end at five. And we can see the continuation of this process of learning to think about other people's thoughts by upping the ante and asking children now not for an action prediction, but for a moral judgment. So first, I'm going to show you the three-year-old again. Now, is Ivan being mean and naughty for taking Joshua's sandwich? Yeah. Yeah. Should Ivan get in trouble for taking Joshua's sandwich? Yeah. yeah. So it's maybe not surprising he thinks it was mean of Ivan to take the Joshua sandwich, since he thinks Ivan only took Joshua's sandwich to avoid having to eat his own dirty sandwich. But now I'm going to show you the five-year-old. Remember, the five-year-old completely understood why Ivan took Joshua's sandwich. Was Ivan being mean and naughty for taking Joshua's sandwich? Yeah. Yeah. And so it's not until age seven that we get what looks more like an adult response. Should Ivan get in trouble for taking Joshua's sandwich? No, because the wind should get in trouble. He says the wind should get in trouble for switching the sandwiches. Okay, now I gotta see if I can switch it back. Okay, hold on a second. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. You can hear me? Hear my headphones. Yeah, I know, but even though my headphones are not... Okay, it's, she said she can hear me, so I'm not gonna try to switch it. If you can't hear me, message Maddie and tell her and she'll tell me. All right, so, Theory of mind I find really, really interesting because basically it means that children are learning that you can be different than I am, like uh, that you can be different than I am. That's what a child is learning. But actually what we know, certainly after the past four plus years politically and ongoing, this is something that adults struggle with too. This theory of mind that allows us, it's not just empathy, it's, it's actually being able to step into someone's shoes and see things differently the way they might be seeing it. That is part of listening too. That's that understanding piece. And so often we think we are saying something that should be obvious to a child. It is not obvious to them. They cannot imagine how we're seeing things. So I, here's, here's an example too that you might think of. If you have ever had a roommate or a partner, somebody you shared your home with and you say, please clean the kitchen. And they say, I did. And you say, that is not clean. That's a theory of mind difference in some ways. Like you both have a different idea about how the kitchen should be clean, but you can't even imagine how somebody else might want the kitchen to be clean. If you're someone who cooks a lot, your idea of a clean kitchen might be different than someone who never does. I, I say this uh, because this is an issue with me and my husband, and it's certainly an issue with our kids. So that is another reason they don't listen is they think they have because they are not mind readers. So theory of mind, these are theory of mind tasks that start with the, the first one is the easiest and it goes to the most difficult. And I'm not going to read through all of these. If you would like a copy of this as a PDF, let me know and I'll, I'll email it to you. But basically it is very hard and it is very complicated. And you can see that complexity go up, especially when you're talking to a teenager. So, you know, number four, understand that people can hold false beliefs about the world. That's certainly something that a teenager might really struggle with, right? And so they, because that's an age of idealism. And so they might struggle with this in a different way because they, they are idealists. They can't understand how somebody could have false beliefs. But again, when you're thinking about why my kids don't listen, one of the reasons might be something to do with theory of mind. So that the next skill or stage of hearing is remembering. And this is, we're going to talk something about echoic memory, which is literally, you've said something to me and I know what you're saying. And I remember that you're saying it. Is what a question? Uh, we have a question oh. from Jessica. It says, at what ages would children be able to accomplish those tasks? At what ages would children be able to accomplish those tasks? Are you specifically talking about the theory of mind tasks? She said yes. Maddie says that the answer is yes. I don't, maybe you all have the chat and I don't need, 
I guess I do need to read these because it's going to be a recording. You know what? They don't know. And, and that's what I think is really interesting because theory of mind is something that they teach us with early childhood. And they also talk about it a lot in the context of kids who are on the autism spectrum, because there's a theory that autism spectrum, those, that those kids may struggle with theory of mind, which will let me just really quick step off the path for a minute and say that I believe when we're talking about autism spectrum disorders, we are talking about a variety of neurodiversity. And so when I say ASD, that's not what somebody else's experience of ASD is. And so I don't think that theory of mind is necessarily something that every person on um, who has autism may struggle with, or they may struggle with it in different ways. So when we talk about theory of mind, we talk about it at this developmental preschool age, and then we talk about it as if it is a deficit. When I look at these tasks though, I. I can see that there are adults who struggle with theory of mind. So I think that it is a skill that is ongoing and learning. And the only thing we know for sure is that four-year-olds tend to know where the whose sandwich is whose. Four and five-year-olds generally were able to do this. And if you Google theory of mind and look on YouTube, you can even find some videos that show you how to test your child's theory of mind if you want to play around with it, because it's kind of fun. Not that your children are guinea pigs, but it's just kind of fun to see where they're developmental, where they are developmentally. So we, we talk about it with the four-year-olds, then we're just starting more to talk about with seven-year-olds and, and how the complexity of theory and of mind grows through the elementary ages, but there's just that not, not that much about it. So I would say if you're thinking about your own child, not to fret too much if they're struggling with it, but maybe it's a thing to work on because it's a skill and working on it would be all the ways that we build empathy. Like, can you imagine this from their point of view, reading books, playing some games about theory of mind, about hiding the sandwich and where is the sandwich, inviting them to imagine, for example, when they find out there's no Santa, can they imagine that somebody else might still believe that there is a Santa? Like there's a lot of opportunities to talk about it and play around with it. Jessica said it will vary depending on a child's capacity for empathy and their sensitivity to others' emotions. Let me, wait, let me pull up the, your, yeah. my chat box because Maddie is talking really fast. <laughs> Do you want me to slow down? Well, I've got my headphones in, so it's hard to hear. Okay. Yes, it would depend on a child's capacity for empathy and their sensitivity to others' emotions. And again, that's, that's a skill that we can build. And theory of mind is not quite empathy because it's not about feeling what somebody else feels. It's really literally saying, if I'm standing here, I can see the light. But if I'm standing like this, I can't see the light. So I can imagine that if you're standing with your back to the camera, you can't see the light. So it, it's a little more concrete, I guess. Does that make sense? I have my chat open now. So poor Maddie does not. So you could. Okay, great. She says, yes, thank you. All right. Okay. So to echo Wick memory, this I found very interesting. So some of this is going to depend on your child's temperament. And I'm not going to get into temperament right now. I might do a training about that. And there is a class on that in the You Are Not Your Mother website. I love temperament talk. I feel like when we dig into our temperament and our child's temperament, it's like all of a sudden everybody understands each other. It's so terrific. But echoic memory is you say something to me and I hear it and and I remember enough to be able to respond. Does that make sense? It's like 20 minutes. You have about 20 minutes, very short-term memory. Um, but the part of that I find interesting, and this goes down to temperament, is if you are somebody with very low distractibility, that means you can be working on something and they can be jackhammering outside and it doesn't bother you. Or you're somebody who's very persistent, who you focus on something, and that is just what you are focused on. It's going to take you about four seconds to register if somebody says something to you. For me, it's longer, all right? For me, it's definitely longer. And when I was a preschool teacher, I can remember I got so used to the kids going, Don, 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 and I could ignore them. I could just tune them right out. And little Samantha one day said, Don Friedman, and got my attention right away. Or my kids figured out they could say, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. But if they needed my attention, really, my son would go, Don, and then I'd he'd get my attention. But generally speaking, somebody who's 
pretty regular and persistence and regular and distractibility. If they're working on something and you say something, it takes them about four seconds to register that you're saying something. And by the time you say, did you say something, you might even already know what they're saying. And again, this is a skill. So the we'll get to the attention bit a little bit later, but some kids are not going to be able to hold that in their brain very long. So you can say something and it's out of their brain so quickly, all right? This is when we talk about younger kids that you, you can't give them, like you can give a, a two-year-old, go get your socks and a three-year-old, maybe you could say, get your socks and bring them to me. And at the older they get, the more that you can add to them. And here's where I'm going to talk about my delightful daughter. She will be 17 next month. And she, this is still, this is still challenging for her. She's smiling. <laughs> This is okay, right? It's true. Yeah. So I would say, Maddie, go get your socks. And she'd go, I'm going to get them. And if she doesn't get them within the 20 minutes, and for her, it's a little bit shorter, they are not going to be got because she is going to completely forgot that I asked her to do that thing. So I need to repeat things more for her. Of course, the challenge for me is once I said, pick up your socks, I forget that I've said it because it's been said. And then I come out of the room and the socks are still on the couch or wherever. This is a fact, correct? Mm -hmm. She's nodding. This is in fact a fact. So the other thing about memory is it's got to do with executive functioning. And I think this is what we're talking about when we're talking about my beautiful daughter here. And executive functioning, we're talking about a lot these days. It's basically that frontal lobe that hasn't finished off. All of it, definitely a fact. Yes, Maddie agrees. And a smiley face because she loves me, even though I talk about her during training. Executive functioning is about memory, attention, and planning. And kids are learning executive functioning. Their, their frontal lobes are finishing off, which means they are not good at this. Back to Ross Green, they do well if they can. They, are, they tend to be bad at executive functioning. And of course, there's a wide range of what that looks like for kids. My son is, is better at executive functioning stuff than Maddie is, but she's also, she's, she's a lot of fun. I gotta say, she's a pretty fun kid. And so it's an even trade-off. When we're talking about executive functioning stuff too, we start talking about ADD, ADHD, spectrum disorders, and also anxiety. Anxiety can limit your executive functioning skills. There's, again, a lot of kids who might meet criteria for some of these things now who are going to grow out of them. And so I'm seeing a tendency among some parents to push for a diagnosis when they're struggling with their child's executive functioning. And sometimes that makes sense but sometimes it's just the frustrating reality of a child. They're just not very good at this. So when we're talking about attention, the types of attention are selective attention, which is right now, you might be trying to ignore a child in your space or somebody's watching Netflix and you can hear it and it's bugging you, but you're able to selectively put your attention on here. Divided attention is, this is me at my in-laws when my uh, father-in-law is talking to me about gardening and my mother-in-law is talking about the family. And I really wanna hear what the mother-in-law is saying and I'm kind of listening to both. So if you're listening to me and also sort of answering a child or kind of glancing at Netflix to see what's going on, that's divided attention. Now, my daughter, again, with her busy brain, she is great at divided attention. She can actually do her homework and watch Netflix. Like she actually can do that. Me, I'm not great at divided attention. I'm better at selective attention. Sustained attention is about attention span, how long you can focus and work on one thing. And this varies among people too. So again, when we're talking to kids and asking them to do something, we need to be aware of what kind of attention we're asking from them. And if that's attention that they're good at or if they need some extra support. Executive attention is that you are able to have sustained attention, that focused attention, even though something else is going on. So in your selective or divided attention, you are able to sustain attention. So the selective and di divided attention are one part, and then these are, th there's some overlap. I hope I'm making sense here. So executive attention is a skill, and kids, again, are not very good at it. The youngest kids are not able to do it at all. When we're talking about toddlers and preschoolers, 
they really can only focus on one thing at a time. And so if you have a child playing Legos and you ask them to put on their shoes, they will not even be able to know that you're talking to them. You're going to actually have to get that attention and get it on you or they won't hear you. It doesn't matter that you think that they've heard you. They might even nod or something, but they haven't heard you. They don't have the memory piece. They don't have the understanding piece. They haven't actually heard you because they don't have that attention capability. Any questions about this so far? I know I'm going really fast. I don't see any. Type them if you need them. So then there's evaluating which is, you've said something to me, I understand it, and now what am I gonna do about it? And again, there's all these little pieces in it, because what I really want you to understand is when we say a kid's not listening, we don't know where in that the child is struggling, and so we might not be sure what we need to do about it, okay? So evaluating means that they hear your words, they recognize your body language, your facial expression, and the context, what's actually going on, what you're actually asking for, what it means this time, and your tone. So something that people struggle with a lot is if your child says, can I have some cookies? And you say, you can have a few cookies and they eat the whole pack. That's because their understanding of what you mean by a few may be different than what you meant. That can also be a struggle if you say a little bit longer, some more, any of those kinds of things a child may not understand. And we may think it's obvious. Again, I didn't mean eat the entire sleeve of cookies. How could you think that? Well, they could think that because that made sense to them because their theory of mind doesn't occur that you just went to the grocery store and you don't want to go again and you needed those cookies for another play date kind do you see what I'm saying? This is why, why kids don't listen is so much more complex. There's another thing too, which is, I'm going to skip to the next slide to explain this. This happens a ton where I'll have uh, somebody come into my office and they're talking about, I can't get my kids to go to bed. They won't go to bed. There's fighting, there's screaming, there's rolling around, there's lollygagging, all of that. And the first thing I do is have them really explain to me exactly what's going on and what's clear is that that parent unintentionally have taught their children not to listen. And I will use my, my own childhood self as an example of this. So my mom would say, go upstairs. You could, we could read for a half hour, get your teeth brushed, get your jammies on, and then you can read till 8.30 and then lights out. And then she would call up the stairs at 8.30, lights out. Well, she thought she was saying lights out. We thought she was saying and now play, as she would say, grab ass for another 15 or 20 minutes until she is losing her mind and ready to charge up the stairs and flip out on us. We sort of thought it was part of the routine to run in and out of each other's rooms, to giggle, to jump on our bed, to make a lot of noise until she said our names with the middle name attached. So until she said, Don Leslie, I didn't think she meant it. She thought she meant it. I didn't think she meant it because we, that was part of our routine. Another example is I would tell my son, I would, we would, he would be at a play date. I would go to pick him up and I'd say, okay, get ready. Let's go. And then I would stand at the door and talk to the other mom for 20, 30 minutes while he'd stand there with his coat on. And I realized I was doing this. He was about five when he said to his friend, they're talking, we still have time to play another round of whatever. So you may be unintentionally teaching your kids. They don't actually have to listen to you until you're screaming. And very often when parents tell me, I'm so tired of screaming, they, they haven't realized they have taught their children that until it escalates to this point, I don't actually mean it. And so they're going to have to do this hard work of retraining their children to respond before everything escalates. So when we're talking to about evaluating, I wanted to talk about sarcasm. Do kids get sarcasm? The research says, not really. They recognize sarcasm when they're about five or six, meaning they can tell that when you're saying me sarcastic never, that you're lying. So if you say, boy, this is a great restaurant and they know it's a bad restaurant, they know you're not telling the truth 
but they don't understand why you're doing it. They don't get the humor of it. So they're not so literal that they think that you think it's a great restaurant. They get that you're, some of them think that you're being mean, like they think sarcasm is just mean. They really don't get it as funny until nine or 10-ish. And obviously this is very individual. And you may notice that nine and 10 is a really sarcastic age and that nine and 10 can be a really mean age. And part of that is they're playing with the idea of sarcasm. So if you're a sarcastic parent, your kids may struggle to understand you until they're about nine or 10. They may see you as being mean when you think you're being funny. They may be confused because you're saying something that they know doesn't make sense. So uh, watch your sarcasm with the kids. And then finally, when they've done all of that hard work, all of that brain work, this is when they actually are then able to respond to what you're asking them to do. So you can see how much work goes into it. So I'm gonna skip these next two slides. They're just like quizzing you. I'm not gonna quiz you. If you think your child is having problems listening because of something else going on, whether that's anxiety, ADHD, an auditory processing disorder, I would say you can ask your pediatrician and talk to them about it. The thing is though, I say that, and I know that most of us, I mean, my daughter, her pediatrician, you know, she saw him for what, 20 minutes, once a year, maybe once every two years and she got older, her pediatrician didn't know her. So that might not be your best bet, but it could be a first start. If you wanted to have your child evaluated, that person is a neuropsychologist and that's a, a neuropsych assessment. It's expensive, it's a lot. If your child's in school and you think the struggles they're having are interfering with schooling, theoretically the school district should pay for it. And I say that, but they often fight you about it. But a neuropsych would be that first step and a speech and language pathologist would be somebody who would really be looking at if your child has auditory processing or something. Again, you're gonna to have to shop around. There's not a whole lot of people who do that work. So if you live in a smaller town, you might struggle with that more. I'd say though, talk to the preschool teacher, talk to the teacher, talk to other parents. I, I think that they can be great people to help you figure out whether or not to take a next step. We as counselors can kind of screen for some things. So if I, if a parent is reporting things to me, I'm kind of running through sort of a screen to go, do I think that maybe this child might benefit from occupational therapy? Do I think that maybe they need um, a bigger batter diet? I don't want to say batter, a bigger, more complex diagnosis. My diagnoses for something like ADHD or um, autism spectrum disorders, that's not something I can uh, diagnose in a way that is useful to getting services. And so then I'll refer that person on to a neuropsych. So you could also see a child therapist and ask, can I just bring my kid in and we can kind of talk and you can tell me if you think I should maybe take next steps to go and get them further evaluated. So now we're going to go to the, what in the heck do you do about it part? So this is, I always say, this is the only parenting book you need. You can throw out all the rest of them. This is it. This is the only one you need. I have three or four copies of it. I have a copy that I got in uh, 1990 when I was just starting doing parenting education. I've got two new copies that are this bright yellow and I've got one on my Kindle. This is a terrific book. And what I'm going to share with you here is from the book. We also in the membership site have this as a book club book where basically you read it and then there's sort of some journaling questions. So you can think about it because it's kind of it's a really good practical book, but it's also sort of heavy. It'll give you some things to think about. One of the reasons I really love it is because, look, it's got these comics. And the comics are great if you're a busy parent and don't have time to read, or if you have a partner who is not going to read a parenting book, but you think would benefit from it. I, When I worked at Shelter, I had a number of clients who literacy was a struggle, and we could use these comics. I also sometimes show these comics to kids to help them communicate with their parents about how they would like to be how they would like conversation to go in their house. So the first thing is, as you know, we just talked about, there's all these big, crazy com complexities of learning or hearing. And so one of the first things you can do is say less. So my clients and the people in the membership site tend to be really wonderful, empathetic, thoughtful, respectful parents who in their effort to be respectful and understanding of their children talk too damn much. I number myself as one of these. Maddie, would you agree that I, 
She is nodding. I over explain. I tell her, I, I tell her why I want things to happen. And that's not helpful. So you don't need to do that. You just need to share the facts of the thing. If you don't let the dog out, she's going to pee on the floor. That you don't need to say, how are you gonna do? Why don't you do blah, blah, blah. And again, this is sort of a theory of mind thing too, that if you say, you know that when I come home, I don't wanna to have to deal with the dog. No, they don't know that. So you can just let them know you need to let the dog out because of this reason. And this is the other thing I say, explain it once. You don't need to explain it again. You don't need to tell them, kids, the milk turns sour when it isn't refrigerated 57 times. You can say it once and the kids will, will know it. I mean, really little kids might not, but they will understand milk belongs in the fridge. Also, you can just describe what you're seeing. I see socks on the couch, I say. She knows what that means. I don't like to see socks on the couch. Socks don't go on the couch. I don't need to say, God damn it, you can never pick up your socks, what's wrong with you? Or this is what my mom used to say, you'd forget your head if it wasn't screwed on, right? I don't need to say that. I can just say, hey, socks on the couch. You can state it. And generally kids want to please you. Generally speaking, they will pick them up. Generally, you know, it doesn't always go that way. The other thing is you don't even say to, need to say, I see socks on the couch. You can just say, Madison, socks. <laughs> She's laughing, I do this all the time. I say, Madison, lights, kitchen lights, Maddie. Kitchen, Maddie. She's supposed to clean the kitchen. Did you clean the kitchen today? She did not clean the kitchen today. Maddie, kitchen. That's what we'll say when we walk in the door. But again, see that top? That's, that's so many of my moms. They talk and they talk and they talk and they talk. They don't need to do that. And then this is a great one. You can get yourself out of the whole thing by creating notes, visual schedules for kids, posters that explain things. And then it's not even you. You don't even need to say, Maddie, kitchen. You can just point to the kitchen sign. You can just let the, the note do the work for you. This is terrific if you're feeling really frustrated or tired of your kids. You can do this even with kids who aren't reading yet because they have great respect for signs. So if you did a sign with a word, you can do pictures too if they're really not reading. And obviously, because it's a sign, this needs to be for really easy stuff. They have a lot of respect for that. So you can, you can write the, the words for the things that you want for little kids and tell them what it says, and they'll pretend to read it often. Oh, you can also do a visual schedule of like what they need to do before they go to bed. And then you're not yelling at them about it. You can just say, oh, did you do everything on the sign? Did you follow the instructions? And then you're sort of aligning yourself with them rather than being the person who is telling them what to do. And it's just a subtle shift that makes it, it just reminds them that you two are a team, that you're on their side. So the other thing, especially because children operate in the world in a variety of ways, is that you can't just talk to them. You also might need to, for some kids, you might need to put your hand on their back or on their arm to get their attention. You might need to make eye contact with them. Not every kid, not, especially kids who are on the spectrum, eye contact may not be comfortable, so that's not appropriate for everybody. But for some kids, you'll need to say, look at me, which you probably already know, but you need to maybe engage in, with more than one senses. You also might need to clear out other things, turn off the TV, click the iPad screen to dark so that they can actually get that attention and pay attention to you. And again, some kids like Maddie, she can hear me even when other things are going on, which just blows my mind because that is a skill I don't have. Okay, so you can email me at Donner at you are, not my, you are Not Your Mother. If you'd like a copy of this, if you have any questions you don't wanna share on here, and also you are welcome to come check out the membership site. But now I'm going to stop recording.